Well, thank you all for being still here after a long day. Um, I am, yes, I, I recently started in Bologna. I'm a, kind of a novel assistant professor there. Um, but um, most of my research, I mean, I just started there. Most of my work has been done uh, in England, where I did my PhD, uh, and in Zurich, where I did my postdoc. Uh, in general, I am, um, I am a statistician, but I consider myself as a very applied statistician uh, in, uh, in general in biology, because I always start from biological problems to then develop uh, statistical methods. And uh, what I've done during my say, short uh, career is can be basically split into two blocks. Um, the first part, what I did during my PhD, is basically to build stochastic models of uh, single cell data in systems biology. And in the second part, I actually turned into a method developer and I uh, stopped pretty much analyzing data and developed ethical uh, methods, basically our packages uh, for bioinformatics data. Now, I give a bit of an explanation of why I mostly use Bayesian, Bayesian, uh, um, Bayesian frameworks. So I don't always necessarily do that. Um, but I think that very often they give you a, a natural framework dealing with biological data. Now, there's a way to question in the chat. Uh, okay, I don't see it. I hope it's uh, it's not about uh, the audio or something very bad. It was me um, telling everyone that they can turn on it. Okay, screen. yes, I I I, I, I guess the link. <laughs> so uh, I know I, I normally go for the Bayesian approach in, in biological data uh, because very often you have uh, latent variables because the measurements are, are often noisy, stochastic, uh, and and that introduces a, a latent a latent variable for the. Uh, for the unobserved original population of um, of uh, biological, I mean biological mRNA or proteins, uh, and that can be easily dealt with based on based on statistics because you just treat latent variables as a parameter and you just sample them within your framework. While in frequentist statistics, dealing with latent with latent variables is actually quite challenging because either you you plug you plug a value into into those variables, but then you neglect the uncertainty, or you use multiple imputation approaches, but then imputing multiple times those variables is not actually an easy job. Well, in Bayesian statistics, you just impute from the posterior distribution of those variables, and that that is a very natural approach. And the second advantage on biological data is that very very often you have prior information, so that could come either from other studies or from other genes. Uh, often in bioinformatics, you, you analyze thousands of genes together. So when you analyze a single gene, you can still bring information from other genes. And that again, can be done in a very elegant and practical way with, uh, with an informative prior. So this is why I mostly use a, a Bayesian framework in, uh, when analyzing biological data. Uh, so I said, my research is split into two major areas. And so today I'm going to focus on the first part uh, which is the one in systems biology, which is probably a little bit heavier from a mathematical point of view. And tomorrow I'll look at um, some of the methods I did in, uh, in bioinformatics. So let me start with the first project. This is going to be basically uh, like something like a two seminar uh, talk. In the first project, uh, I analyzed uh, the movements of an RF2 protein, uh, which is a transcription factor. It's, and it plays basically an important protective role in the cells because it regulates the expression of some antioxidant genes, where if you have excessive oxidative, oxidative stress, uh, you may have a contribution in several diseases. And so the aim of this study was to uh, improve the knowledge of this system by studying some, uh, some data. That basically looked like that we have fluorescent reporter images of the NRF2 in a cell where you can see that there is uh, a separation that you can draw between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And we actually semi-manually, semi-automatically, that took a long time, uh, place a border on the cell and on the nucleus. You see there is already some, uh, some noise in the measurement because there are various places where you could put this border. Now, once you do that, you can compute the average intensity in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm and get to two numbers, basically, that give you the average light intensity of your NRF2 proteins in nucleus and cytoplasm. Now, if you do that every two minutes across many hours, you get to a bivariate tensorist 
that looks like that, where you can see that uh, you have the nucleus and the cytoplasm on the top, the cytoplasm on the bottom. You can see that there are some also some translocations uh, between the nucleus and cytoplasms and isolations. For instance, here the nuclear NRF2 drops in the nucleus, uh, while in the cytoplasm it jumps. Uh, and the same thing happened there. There's a drop in the nucleus, an increase in the cytoplasm, and there again. And you see the opposite behavior when there is an increase in the nucleus, there is a decrease in the cytoplasm. So obviously the two are correlated. Basically, when an RF2 moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, it, it, it increases one of the two time series while it decreases the other one. Now, however, you see that there is quite uh, some noise in, in, the, in the balance between the two because there is not a perfect correspondence. And that is due to several factors. So first of all, the volumes are quite different. And so when there is a movement from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and vice versa, then the light intensity generates, it's very different because the, the, that's obviously dilutes a lot more in the cytoplasm than it does in the nucleus because it has a higher volume. And secondly, because there are many other things going on, there's not a, you don't just have this movement. You also have synthesis of new, of new, um, of new proteins. You have degradations in the nucleus, degradation in the cytoplasm. And obviously you have noise in the measurements that we make. Uh, for instance, these borders change across time because the cells move and we have to follow them over time. So this is a very noisy process. But within this noisy process and uh, this, this noise that comes from both the biology and the measurement, we want to try and model these oscillations and the biological process underneath to study what is driving them and to infer some, bio some useful biological parameters. So to do that, the first thing we have is a biological scheme that describes this kind of movements. Obviously, this was done from um, with our uh, with, from our bio, from our collaborators. So here you have on the top the cytoplasm, and then at the bottom the nucleus. And you can see that an RF two is normally bound, is normally kept in the cytoplasm in this complex with KEEP one and PGM five. But when this complex disrupts, it can enter the nucleus where it starts transcribing genes, and then it is phosphorylated via a fin, and then it exits the nucleus and then is bound again into this complex. So you can furthermore see that there is an indirect uh, regulation between the cytoplasmic and the nuclear abundance, because when this complex is, is disrupted, and R2 entered the nucleus on one hand, but on the other hand, this PGM5 allows to phosphatase fin, which then enters the nucleus and phosphorylates an RF2 and allows it to exit. So there is an indirect regulation between the nuclear and the cytoplasmic and RF2, which is very complex to model. And obviously, we would like to observe and model all this entire scheme, uh, but that is not possible in practice because we don't we don't observe all those um, all those players. We don't observe KEEP1, PGM5, and FIM. We all observe an RF2. And therefore, starting from that complex scheme, we greatly simplify it into a reaction network with five reactions, where an RF2 in the cytoplasm can move into the nucleus, exit the nucleus again, and then you have a synthesis that can happen in the cytoplasm and degradation that can happen both in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. And so this is a simplified scheme that tries to summarize the key features of the more complex one. And to this scheme with five reactions, we clearly associate a table with reaction with a reaction network with rates. So we have, first of all, we have this vector here that models what happens to our reaction, what, what, what happens to our, to our system when each one of these reaction uh, appears. So when there is a nuclear input, you have an increase of one in the nuclear abundance. So here you have a vector that explains what changes happen in the nucleus, in the first element, and in the cytoplasm. So when, when there is a nuclear input, a molecule moves from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And so there is a plus one in terms of total abundance in the nucleus and a minus one in the cytoplasm. The opposite happens when a molecule moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. There is a decrease of one molecules in the nucleus and an increase of one in the cytoplasm. And then when you have synthesis, there is an increase of one molecules in, in the cytoplasm. And with degradation, there is a decrease 
of one molecules either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm, depending on where this happens. And in our reaction network, we associate rates to these, um, to these events. And so here you see these rates that basically indicate how likely the, the, um, these events, these reactions are to happen. And in particular, we have a linear rate for the nuclear input. So again, from the cytoplasm into the nucleus and a more complex nonlinear rate for the opposite movement, where here we also have a delay where I'm not going too much into details. This is not so important, but this delay tries to make the model as realistic as possible. And it basically models the fact that when an Earth 2 enters the nucleus, technically we don't allow it to exit straight away because it has to undergo a process where it's where it phosphorylated. And this process typically takes time. So this delay models this intermediate waiting time until the NRF2 is, is phosphorylated, and then it can exit uh, um, the nucleus. And then you have, again, a, a constant synthesis and linear degradation rates. Now, you don't actually have to fully understand the mathematics behind it, but what's important is that we have some uh, formulas for these rates. And these formulas are important because if you take a very small time interval, what happens is that this is a continuous time or this is a continuous process over time. So these reactions change all the time because as X changes, these reactions change. But if you take a very small time interval dt, then these reactions are stable because the X's, the molecules are stable and therefore the reactions are stable. And so these reactions approximate the probability that a reaction, uh, sorry, these hazards approximate the probability that reaction action happen in a very small time interval. And so you can basically model this as a birth and death mark of jump process, where basically each reaction can be approximated by an independent Poisson that depends on these hazards and on the time interval. And again, this only holds for a small time interval where the X's are stable and therefore the reaction, the, the hazards are also stable. Now, as I said, this is a technically continuous time process, but we only observe it at discrete time points. And so we use a, the diffusion approximation that basically associates a stochastic delay differential equation to the previous birth and death process, where, again, without going into many details, the you have a mean and a variance that depends on the previous hazards, where you can see that the mean change in the nuclear abundance is basically given by the hazard for the nuclear input minus the nuclear export minus the degradation. And in the cytoplasm, you have the opposite. You have the nuclear export minus the input plus the synthesis minus the degradation. And similarly in the matrix, in the, in the covariance matrix. Now, we use a second approximation that basically gives us a, a normal likelihood for the changes between two consecutive time points with mean and variance that were defined before. So although there was quite a lot of formulations, I think I hope I can uh, catch up with the few who got lost here, because from this moment, we just have a normal likelihood. And what we aim to model is the difference between two consecutive time points. So if you look at these points, they're very close to each other. So it's quite reasonable to assume that the, that the hazards are quite stable across consecutive points. So we just take the difference between two consecutive time points, we have a bivariate change, and from that, we fit a bivariate normal with mean and variance that depends on the hazards that we have defined. Now, the natural question is, why did we use a stochastic model instead of the deterministic one? Uh, because very often in biology, we use deterministic models. Well like deterministic models like ordinary differential equations work very well when you model the average signal in a large population. So like bulk data, when you average many cells and you look at the average, well, the deterministic models tell you, I mean, model quite accurately where the average is going. But on single cell data, there is a lot of noise. And so deterministic models are not realistic. And in particular, uh, as we've, we've shown, Deterministic models do not oscillate on this system. And so the deterministic model would basically be a line because this system only oscillates when there is noise. And so we actually need a stochastic one. So I mentioned before that we have to acknowledge not only about the biological um, noise, but also about 
the measurement noise. And so now I'm going to briefly describe how we actually obtain our measurements. So normally you would have a DNA that transcribes into uh, an mRNA that translates into a protein. And this is the, the object you would like to infer, but that's not what we observe. What we do in practice is to take DNA fragments and engineer them, and then we plug them into the cells. And this engineered DNA will transcribe into reporter mRNA that will translate into a reporter protein. And then when we stimulate this reporter protein with a laser, we obtain a light intensity. And that's what we measure. So this light intensity is a noisy measurement of this reporter protein. Now the assumption behind this, which is quite reasonable, is that this reported protein behaves similarly to the original protein we are studying. But we still have the issue of this noisy measurement because in reality in the cell, we have a number of, basically we have counts, a number of uh, molecules for the mRNA proteins in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. But that's not what we observe. We observe a light intensity. And so we actually have to add a measurement equation that relates the unobserved population of molecules in the cell to the actual observations Y. So we use a classical assumption that the observations are proportional to the biological measurements, and then there is a stochastic uh, noise on top of that, where this proportionality constant kappa is actually different between nucleus and cytoplasm because they have different volumes, so we cannot assume the same one. Uh, and the same thing stands for, for the error. We assume a normal error where, again, the nucleus and cytoplasmic um, abundances have a different variance. But apart from the mathematical details, uh, the, the general key point is that we have a continuous biological process, which is only observed every delta, in our case, two minutes. And again, we, we, we would like to observe axes, which are the biological populations of proteins, but we actually observe these noisy measurements Y of the axis. And the aim again is to disentangle the biological noise from the measurement one, because we actually want to remove the measurement uh, noise, which is nuisance here. It's something we don't want to infer in order to actually do a proper inference on the biological uh, variability that we're interested in. Uh, mathematically, from a Bayesian perspective, say, uh, the way we deal with this is to use a data augmentation approach. And here is the first, uh, first of the two reasons I mentioned about why Bayesian models are useful, because here we have latent variables. So the Xs are latent variables for us. They are unobserved populations of, of, of molecules. And so we, feed, we use an MCMC scheme where we sample in an alternative way from the conditional distributions of our parameters, which are basically the biological and the measurement error parameters, given the axis and the observations y. And then we sample the axis themselves. So we sample the biological measurements given the biological parameters and the observations y. So we basically treat these axes, so the, the, the population of proteins, we treat it as a parameter. So we simply enlarge our posterior space and we have a lot of parameters to sample. It doesn't really matter that there are population of molecules, um, sorry, the, the population of, um, of proteins. Now, I mean, feel free to interrupt me anytime because I, I will just keep going unless I'm stopped. Now, this system uh, is, is, is valid for a single cell, but in general, we actually observe multiple cells. And so we embed this in a, so every cell gives us basically a bivariate time series. And we embed this in a Bayesian hierarchical framework, where if you're not familiar with it, this is exactly the parallel uh, to the frequentist mixed effects model. So we have basically that every Y here at the bottom is a different cell that gives us a bivariate time series. And every, every cell is associated to a vector of, as you see, uh, nine, nine numbers, nine parameters, that changes from cell to cell. So we actually model the biological variability between cells. So each cell is allowed to have a different parameter vector. But obviously it would be a waste of information to model every cell independently because cells behave 
differently, but also similarly to each other. And so we have a common prior here that allows for sharing of information across cells so that when we infer the parameters of every cell, we infer them from the data that comes from the cell, but also from the common hyper prior, which is inferred from the other cells. Uh, so I was saying that this kind of, you know, cell specific parameters and sharing of information, this is obviously not something that's specific to our model. That's a general property of the hierarchical models. Um, and then, I mean, I, I don't know how much you've seen of, of MCMC, so I won't, I won't really go into details, uh, but just if, if you kind of know enough to understand, I'll give you a few details. Uh, we have here for every cell, as you see, two, four, five biological and four measurement error parameters. We don't update all of them together because that would be very hard to do. So we put them in blocks. I think we do three or four blocks where each block has parameters that are highly correlated with each other, like synthesis and degradation. They're very correlated. And then we use a Metropolis um, sampler uh, to update each block. And then in particular, we use what's called an adaptive random walk, where I don't know if you've seen this, but in the Metropolis sampler, you need to propose values and then ac you accept or reject them depending on their, uh, on their posterior. And so we don't propose them from a diagonal covariance matrix, but basically the covariance matrix of our proposal follows the posterior so that we propose values which are more coherent with the shape of the posterior, so that it's more likely that they're accepted. Again, this is not something very fancy. This is a classical, very, very classical scheme. I, I use very basic uh, um, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian methodologies. Um, after we've done that, obviously, we need to, we had to validate the method in simulation studies. And so we simulated, um, we simulated data from what's called the Gillespie algorithm. And we tried to re-infer the parameters and we made sure that the inferred parameters are close to the original ones we simulated from. And here we get to the second part of the advantage of a Bayesian approach in this particular analysis. And that relates to the informative priors. We actually have very informative prior about several parameters. So first of all, the degradation. Uh, there was another study where they did pretty sophisticated experiments that we didn't have to redo, where they uh, inferred the degradation rate of an RF2. And we used that as a prior for our degradation rate. And secondly, the measurement error. Well, we have, uh, you know, as, as you've seen, the, the, the measurement process is actually quite noisy and we have to define a border and then, um, and that is, is not really an automatic procedure. So what we did was to repeat that procedure multiple times from the same data. And uh, the differences between the, the data that you obtain obviously only refer to the measurement process because the, the biological process is, is the same because it's the same actual data. And so we did that multiple times and estimated the measurement error parameters. And then we used these initial estimates as informative prior for these parameters. And that was absolutely crucial because you have a bivariate time series and you have a combination of nine parameters that can actually give those time series. And those are very correlated parameters. There are many combinations basically of those parameters that are going to give you extreme, extremely similar values of the likelihood of the posterior. And it's going to be very hard to identify the right combination. So it's absolutely crucial in this kind of data in this kind of analysis to have informative priors that somehow help you to, I mean, to put a limit on some parameters and constrain them to a, to a, um, in a, in a limited region. Okay, so briefly here are a bit of results about the uh, posterior distributions of two, four, eight, how many here? Okay, we have 10 parameters. I don't, I don't remember anymore why we have 10. That was that was a while ago. That was 2013. Um, but you can see you have blue and red lines. They refer to the two experimental conditions we analyzed. We have 35 cells into one condition and 36 into the other one, which means we have 70 cells. This is very hard to read. Instead, we look at the hyper parameters, which basically, basically represent a summary across all the cells at the group level. So we have two groups, that means two hyper mean parameters. So first thing to note is that without going again in details, 
but we infer useful quantities that are informative for our biologists, like synthesis, degradation rates, or the ratio between the nuclear and the cytoplasmic volumes. Uh, and importantly, we showed that, for instance, the, the export from the nucleus to the cytoplasm is about three times faster than the import. Um, and when we stimulate the cells, both movements are accelerated. So you get an RF2, basically an RF2 becomes a little bit more hysterical and it moves more uh, rapidly between nucleus and cytoplasm. And finally, we did a, a quite sophisticated mathematical analysis, which I, I didn't really do much in this. That was pretty much guided from, by, uh, by David Rent. And, um, and here we basically tried to investigate how stable the system is around the stationary solution. And again, skipping the mathematical details, what we found is that um, the system behaves most of the times in most of the cells like a noise-induced oscillator, which is what I mentioned briefly before. Uh, that means uh, that the system does not oscillate in a deterministic context. So if there is no noise, the system is flat. It converges to an equilibrium. But when you reduce the population of, of, uh, of molecules and you introduce noise into the system, so in a limited, finite population, then the system very often oscillates. Um, and that has a particular uh, biological feature. And also we noticed that this behavior is a lot more frequent, well, a lot, it's more frequent when the cells are stimulated, like roughly two thirds of the cells, compared to when the cells are not stimulated, roughly one cell out of two. And this again is reasonable because when you stimulate cells, you have more noise. And so they tend to uh, behave more like, uh, they tend to display more often oscillations. Um, so very briefly, very briefly wrapping up this first part at six, so I, I'll try to keep it short. Um, we've seen, we, we wanted to study this, this system because it, it plays an important role in protecting uh, cells. Uh, and to do that, we study these oscillations between nucleus and cytoplasm. Uh, we've developed a framework that we apply on data. And really the key, fee, the key findings we have is that uh, the biological parameters are, we infer are useful per se because they tell us more or less what are the rates of the import, the export, the degradation, and so on. And importantly, the main finding we have is that we see that this system behaves and only displays oscillations in a the stochastic noise and not in a deterministic one. Um, so unfortunately, we never published that one. I, I really hope I will be able to, to write it up in the, um, in the next year. I'll, I'll give you a minute to uh, to recollect your thoughts, and um, I'll get into the second part of the of the talk, which is about a completely different project. Um, it has little to do with the previous project, so it really is a block of two seminars in a way that unfortunately not uh, connected in a continuum. Uh, but I think this is a this is a simple project to follow. There's less mathematics here. So we're still talking about flow cytometry data here. It's still single cell data, uh, stochastic models, and systems biology. But here we try to model transcription. And we have a, a two-state model for transcription. So the interesting part here is that this model is a time series again, because it's a process that evolves over time. But we don't observe it in across time. We only observe it at a discrete time point. So it's actually challenging mathematically because we try to model time series data uh, while observing it only at a single time point. I mean, let me know if uh, there is a question for now or if I should go ahead. Um, it's a question from the previous part model. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, fine. Yeah, but mm -hmm. move ahead. Could you please comment on the format of prior distribution you used for the first in the first study? Uh, can you say again? The prior distribution. Yes, if comment, comment on what? If you can comment on the form. Or for like, like the actual formulation. Mm, uh, I, I mean, if, if we ever asked the I question. think the question is about the shape of the, the shape. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, shape meaning the actual formula for the priors. Hassan, you want to? Yeah, maybe Hassan can speak up. Yeah. 
he said yes okay <laughs> the cool. shape um so it's quite simple because you know all our parameters here uh if i'm not wrong again that that, that was like 10 years ago but uh all our parameters are positive okay uh, none of these rates is negative so it's very natural to work with log so we actually work with the log of these parameters so the log is is strictly positive so sorry the log sorry of a positive constant is goes uh, spans into r and so on the log it's a very natural choice to have a normal prior on the log so we use log parameters with a normal prior uh, normally for most of these parameters we use a vaguely informative prior which which basically means we try not to have uh, you know to have as little information as possible uh, but on these four parameters here we actually use uh, uh, still a log normal prior on the log of these parameters uh, with mean and standard deviation which were identified from these studies so basically uh, in this case here for instance on the measurement error we have repeated measurements so we can actually infer the mean and the standard deviation of log sigma for instance okay and that really gives us mean and standard deviation for log sigma and that is exactly what defines our prior now log sigma will have a prior with mean and standard deviation which were identified from this analysis uh the degradation here rate the degradation rate here was a little bit more uh arbitrary because we just had a point estimate, right? We didn't have the standard deviation. So we choose, again, for the log of the degradation, we took um, the, the, the mean on the log scale. And then we, for a standard deviation, I think we choose something that was kind of reasonable, but it was a bit arbitrary. So I hope I answered your question um, and I didn't go off topic. Yes, he answered yes, thank you very much. He's in the training, that's why he cannot talk. <laughs> So uh, maybe just a minute. Any other questions on this part? Yeah, uh, Isabel, uh, I'm, I have a question concerning the noise that you described at the end. Uh, this noise is related to the experimental variability or biological variability? No, no, no biological. I mean, um, no, 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 biological variability. So the thing is that if you have uh, a large population, there is little noise. And this system does not oscillate, it's flat. Mm -hmm. If you have a limited very population, then there is biological noise and the system uh, often oscillates. And if you would have taken more cells, uh, this noise would have been reduced or? Uh, well, I mean, if you, this is still at the single cell level. Mm -hmm. We're still talking about single cells. So if you have a, a, a single cell with a huge population of molecules, then the, the noise is decreased and it's less likely that it oscillates. Okay. As the population goes to infinity, the, the oscillations completely disappear. The more stochasticity there is, the more likely it is to oscillate. Mm -hmm. and then when, you average, when you average many cells, you completely lose this behavior because this behavior is in single cells. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This behavior is in single cells. When you average many, you have... Uh, you have this behavior which is averaged out and then it's 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 certainly a constant okay thank you andrea yeah, has a yeah. andrea has a hand yeah yeah i'll try maybe i'll try to make sense i hope so so in case that for example you had another treatment and then you will have noise for two treatments so then you will have a hierarchical that can be also like used but how would you fit like a, a prior in that case you will have a mean for each one or how will you work with that? uh what, what do you mean uh can you uh, uh can you we try again to uh, so rephrase. for example they are there in that hierarchy yeah, I... there you so there you have for example one experiment so you can summarize everything they are just one exp experimental sampling in case that you will add another sampling group i don't know whatever yeah uh, that the cells are affected by another by other kind of cancer. I don't know, whatever you know. Sure, I'm getting, I'm getting. You can still use this hierarchical model, right? So yes, um, I, I I forgot to clarify that this hierarchy is within the same experimental condition. So here we have 35 basalts and 36 stimulated cells. So this hierarchy is for the basalt cells that are analyzed separately from the stimulated ones. So the 35 basal cells 
have a hierarchy and when you do your analysis, and then the 36 stimulated cells have a different hierarchy, a different analysis. Uh, that's what I wanted to understand. Okay, I forgot to clarify that it's within each exper each experimental condition is analyzed separately. That's what I meant because then yes. the mean and the standard deviation for each group I assume is different, yes. right? And then well, that's exactly yes, that's exactly what you try to study, right? So yeah. if you like, th this is basically what you have here. This is the mean, the pos this is the hyper mean, so the group level mean for the basal in blue and stimulated in red condition. Yeah. So they are different. And that's actually what you aim to study. You also, I mean, among other things, you also want to understand the differences between these two parameters. And then just a really basic question, the difference between those two in this posterior, then it's just a subtraction. How would you like fit the difference? You know, oh, yeah, know what I mean? I don't mean mathematical difference. I mean, like change. I mean, difference. Yeah, but then you will say there is a change. How will you say there was a change? You know, like you have posteriors for one group, posteriors for another group in hierarchical, two hierarchies. Then how do you say there are differences if you are getting posteriors for each hierarchy? So you mean like how uh, if you can build a statistical test to make sure that the difference exactly. is significant? Yeah. Sure, you can also build a statistical test. We, we didn't do that. That was quality. No, okay. It was like, okay, that's yeah. what I meant. Uh, that, that was our primary aim also because, I mean, to do that, you really need, I think, a lot of information. There is a lot of noise also in your estimates because uh, there's a lot of noise in the data. Uh, but you do see that there is a clear shift. And so you can take that as, a, for instance, we see- Enough information, yeah. yeah With the clear you shift, that, you say it is clear enough that- I that mean, also in this, for instance, these parameters indicate how quickly the import and export are. And you see that in the stimulated condition, they're faster, which also, by the way, makes sense because you stimulate cells, so you expect a change of that kind. And compared to the other parameters, you see that there's not there's a stronger change in these parameters than there is in the other parameters. Yeah, I got it. And just <laughs> last thing, it was, how can I say it? It's really not possible to just have one hierarchy for everything? All together, or is it like it's really computational, or is really not possible statistic wise? Well, it doesn't make sense biologically because when, when you're basically saying when you fit the model, you're basically saying that um, the same parameters are shared across basal and stimulated. Uh, that's inaccurate, right? It's like having okay, sorry, yeah, sorry, uh, I uh, that. yeah, samples, right? It, it's it's reasonable to assume that they follow different parameters. And, and, and again, you're probably interested in studying. You may be interested in studying those differences. Well, if you assume that the same, then first of all, that's probably inaccurate. And secondly, you cannot study the difference anymore between them. And thirdly, you don't really need it because with 35 cells, you have enough sharing of information between them. Uh, you know, having 35 or 70. Yes. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah, and now I got it with me. Yes, thanks. Simone, I have a question on yes. this. Um, if you were to compare the, the two conditions using this posterior distribution, you would compare the distribution themselves or uh, rather the mean or something to, to oh, get some. You can do various things. Um, we haven't, as I said, we haven't really done a testing. You see, uh, you have various things. Here you have the kind of the high, the, the hierarchical densities of the parameters, but again, it's 70. 71 densities. Uh, what we did is was basically to look at the hyper mean. So basically the group level mean. So the posterior distribution for the hyper mean parameter of um uh, yeah of, of, of our nine, 10 parameters, and to see how that changes. Mm -hmm. But really, I think the main finding was actually not to, to compare the two, but actually to then use these estimates which is basically this linear stability analysis. So here, we basically replace these numbers with our estimates. So we replaced them with, with the estimate that we got from the model. And that brought us to a, a, another, uh, yeah, to the, the oscillation conclusion. Okay, thank you. There's also a question in, uh, from Asan in the, in the chat, how these posterior graphs are interpreted? Could you explain one of, the gra of these graphs? <laughs> well, I mean, you have here the, again, I haven't shown actually, but um, yeah, um, you see, you have this kind of parameters and then you have a hyper mean. 
this actually has a meaning for for every uh, for each one of these nine again it's two four yeah it's nine for each one of these nine parameters you have a hyper mean and a hyper uh, variance of standard deviation um, and so you actually have several hyper parameters at the group level that you can plot we tend to focus on the mean so this is the posterior density of the hyper mean parameter for i don't i think this is this should be basically this parameter should be in order so parameter kd then ke then bk and so on so each one of these plots shows a different biological or measurement parameter and uh the density is just the posterior i mean in the mcmc you get basically a vector of you know very long vector of values and from that vector you can build the density that's that's what you aim to do right you aim to approximate the posterior density with a finite sample so this is the density from your finite sample under the two conditions i'm not i'm not sure i i i, I replied to the question but i think so okay i think so too <laughs> you think I, I did reply, uh, but I, I don't know if it was off target. Uh, I want to attribute also how these are interpreted biologically. I'm sorry? What is the biological interpretation of these plots? Ah, biological. Well, that's a different thing. I mean, here you have, I mean, these plots indicate uh, where your, it, these are estimates of your parameters, right? That is kind of the next step. So it, it's like, I mean, it, this is a general statistical problem. Like when you do an estimate, how do you interpret that? Well, then you go and talk to the biology and you say, look, this parameter, I estimate that it, you know, this is my point estimate and this is say a confidence or credible interval around that and, and talk to them and try to infer. So one of the things, as I said, one of the things that we found, for instance, with these parameters is that the expert is three times faster than the input. That's one biological interpretation. Um, or again, we use them to, to get this other biological interpretation about the noise-induced oscillator. So that actually goes back to the, to the biologist and talking to them and say, these are the numbers I estimated, but regardless of whether they're Bayesian or not, uh, it's probably a little bit harder to interpret uh, Bayesian densities rather than single numbers. But these densities can be summarized in numbers. You can easily point, you can easily get your estimate, which is say the posterior mode and a posterior credible interval, which is easier to um, to um, to interpret. Thank you. Answer? No, the answer is that's very clear. You made my day, little smile. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Right. Should I add? <laughs> okay, I, I will anticipate future questions and go ahead. Uh, so this one, I don't know, it sounds a, a bit arrogant actually, but I mean, I put the name of the paper here because in case you're interested, you can look at our paper. This one, this one was at least published, uh, unlike the other one. So again, this second project is about I'm saying transcription. Uh, and so we actually examined a few models of transcription and we try to make a more say, realistic one. Okay, model number one, simple scenario. Gene, here you have gene state on, is constantly active and it transcribes mRNA at rate alpha. And then this is the grade at rate beta. Uh, this is again, birth in that process, meaning that every transcription is a birth, every degradation is a death uh, with exponential waiting times. You can see that although this is a process that evolves over time, the stationary distribution is a Poisson, meaning that if you let it run for long and you record several values, you will have values that are distributed like a Poisson, where the rate of the Poisson is basically the synthesis over the degradation. Now, this model is, is typically not realistic uh, because, um, because that is normally, at least fluorescent, that is normally really over dispersed compared to the Poisson. So the variance is much larger than the mean. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you remember, but in the Poisson, the mean is, is the same as the same value as the variance, which is a very strong assumption. So a more realistic model that extends this one is model two, where you have an active and an inactive state. 
So the gene alternates between a non-state and an off-state, again, with exponential distributed waiting times, K1, K0. And when it's off, it doesn't transcribe at all, completely flat. When it's on, it transcribes mRNA. So this, this model is a lot more realistic. It models for overdispension, and importantly, it models for transcriptional bursts. So transcriptional bursts are short moments of time where a large amount of transcription is transcribed. You see, the gene is typically, the gene will be mostly inactive and rarely turns on and transcribes a lot. So that's, that's what typically happens. And if we look again at the stationary distribution, so we let, it, we let it run for long and we take several values, it's going to follow a beta Poisson, a Poisson beta distribution, where basically your transcription is distributed like a Poisson with rate alpha, well, alpha tilde times P, where P models the on-off state of the gene. So MP itself is a beta. So it's basically alpha times of the gene. Uh, and P is the state of the gene and is distributed like a beta. So this one, obviously, you see as more noise because we've put here something which is not a constant, but a parameter of the Poisson is itself a random variable. Um, now, one thing to note is that these parameters, can not, the alpha, K1, K0, and so on, they cannot be estimated directly, but they have to be rescaled compared to the degradation, simply because this problem is not, um, how do you say, um, you can, it's not, a, not all parameters are simultaneously identifiable, uh, but the same happened in the simpler model, you see, you can only identify the ratio of the parameters. Uh, but, but it's still useful because you can still identify parameters. It's just that the unit of the parameters is not the degradation rate. Now, we actually, so this is the model I just described. We actually further extend this by adding one arrow here. So we, we use, again, this two-state model. But now we allow for transcription in the off state as well, because we think that it's not realistic to assume that when the gene is off, it's completely dormant and it transcribes nothing. We assume for some transcription in the off state, where obviously this is going to be lower than in the on state, and typically much lower. Now, the stationary distribution of this model, again, so you let it run for long, uh, that has already been derived. But in our work, we showed that, again, you can write this as a compound of a Poisson and a beta. And again, it's quite intuitive because the Poisson so the mRNA is a Poisson distribution where you have a back kind of a base level of transcription, which is what you have in the off state. And then only when the gene is on, so when P is one, you also have an additional value, which is the difference of the on transcription and the off. So basically when the gene is off, you have alpha zero. When the gene is on, you have alpha one, because that's what, what you are here. And again, the gene on-off state of the gene is distributed like a beta. And again, all parameters are, respect, are rescaled with respect to the degradation. Now, uh, this distribution here, as I said, it was already available, but the density of X is actually very unstable. And uh, it's very hard computationally to compute. So with this structure here, we simplified our inference, as, as I will explain later, because we actually never compute the density of X. And instead, we sample from it because it's very hard to compute the density, but it's very easy to sample from this distribution. OK, so here is just a, a simulation to show how transcriptional bursts typically behave. Uh, this is pretty long. Here is zoomed in an area. So you see in red, you should see kind of when the gene turns on and when it's off. So when it turns on, it only turns on in this simulation for short time intervals. And when it does, you see this is the mRNA, there is a large transcription. And so the mRNA jumps and it then degrades. And then again, there is a burst with a high transcription and then it degrades again. So this is how, um, how the mRNA behaves with our, with our model. And the, stash, and the stationary distribution of this kind of model, so if you were to look at basically horizontally, uh, basically the density here, it looks like that, okay. uh, which is, which is significantly over dispersed compared to the Poisson. Uh, so again, like in the other case, we have biological noise that I roughly described, but then we also have a, a, a source of noise that comes from the measurement. Um, in this case, the process is quite different. Uh, 
because here we don't engineer the DNA. We actually have the original DNA that transcribes an mRNA, and then we put a fluorescent tag on this original mRNA. And again, we do a laser stimulation and we record a light intensity. Um, and again, this the measurement of the light intensity is noisy because we have a, a population of mRNA molecules, uh, but we only actually then observe a, an intensity of light. And so once again, we use a measurement equation with a proportionality constant. So in this case you, is univariate, so there's only one kappa. And then there is, again, a random noise on top of that. So there is a stochastic uh, error. In this case, note that the, there is a mean parameter here because we actually detect background noise. So we actually have a positive error with, with a positive mean, which is basically detecting uh, just background noise. Um, and so again, we get to our parameter vector, which is given by the four biological and three measurement parameters. Uh, and again, we try to separate the two sources of variability. Now, in this case, we proceed in a different way compared to what we've seen before. We still have a latent state for the mRNA population of, uh, of molecules. But before we've done a data augmentation approach where we sample them, here we do indeed, we try to integrate them out. And I will explain later why we choose a different approach. So our data is this Y here. So to do our inference, we would like to have the, the marginal likelihood of the data. But as I said, that depends on the, that is basically an integral with respect to the population of molecules X. So this integral is obviously not tractable. But instead, as I said, instead of computing the X, we sample from it. And so if we, since we can easily sample from this uh, distribution of X, if we sample a large amount of particle, a large amount of values from, from X that we call Z, we can basically approximate this integral here, but with this function here, okay? So this is an unbiased estimate of this, um, of this marginal density there. Now, in the MCMC algorithm, in a metropolis sampler, you normally have to propose a value and then accept, reject, depending on the posterior. But the posterior depends on the likelihood here, which we're not computing. So here we use what's called a pseudo-marginal approach, where basically the posterior here is replaced by an unbiased estimate, which is this one here. Okay, so we don't use the posterior of Y, but we use an estimate of, of its posterior. Sorry, an estimate of its marginal, which, which is then used for the posterior. Um, and, and that actually, since the estimate is unbiased, that still converges to the right, uh, to the right posterior. Now, as I said, in the other case, we use a different approach. We use a data augmentation approach. Um, there is a reason why we haven't done this here. Here, for every um, um, for every sample, we have multiple. We have seven parameters, but we have multiple observations. We have about one thousand observations. So, using a data augmentation approach would have meant having roughly one thousand values of x and one thousand values of p, that are very correlated, by the way. So, instead of having seven parameters, we would have had two thousand and seven parameters to explore which would have been really, really hard. And also, these parameters are very correlated. So it would have been harder to explore uh, the, the posterior space. With this pseudo-marginal approach, we try to integrate out the linear variables. And so we have a, a much smaller posterior space to explore, and that simplifies our inference. So we get better mixing and convergence of the posterior chains. Um, again, this is valid for a single, um, replicate. Um, in this case, in the other case we've seen in the NRF2, one cell was giving us multiple uh, multiple measurements, right? Here, as every cell gives us only one measurement. So it's a different context, but we still have a hierarchical model. Before, we had it, the hierarchy on the cell. Here, we have the hierarchy on the replicates. We have four replicates, and each replicate gives us 1,000 measurements. So here, the Y here is a vector of length 1,000 made of 1,000 cells. This, this replicate has a parameter vector of length 7. And again, there, each replicate has a different parameter vector, but again, there is sharing of information. So we also use the information 
from the other three replicates. So it's the same framework, but applied in a different context. Here, the hierarchy is on the, on the replicate and not on the cell. Um, I'm not sure this is more confusing or useful, but I still, I'll still uh, explain this. Uh, here is a picture of the graphical model. I don't know if you're fa familiar with this, but it, it should, in theory, simplify the intuition, um, although, although it, may, it may complicate it now. So say you have your hyperparameters here, delta, sorry, theta. Uh, so your hyperparameter generates a bunch of hierarchical parameters, in our case, again, four. And these are the biological hyper hierarchical parameters. Each one of these generates a bunch of real biological observations, which we don't see. But these are real biological populations of mRNA. So this will be a vector of length 1,000 for each replicate. Now you also have your hierarchical measurement error parameters. And then you have here your observations, where the observations depend on the real biological measurements as well as on the measurement error parameters. So basically what we, we have is that we observe these Ys and we try to integrate out the Xs in order to get all this bunch of hierarchical and importantly, hyperparameters. Uh, if you got lost, you can catch up now. Um, again, second advantage I mentioned about, I mean, at least for me, uh, about uh, second major advantage of Bayesian statistics, informative priors. Once again, we have a lot of parameters here. This is a very challenging task because we have a univariate density. And then we try to estimate seven parameters from it. That's basically an impossible task. There is That is almost not, um, how do you say, um, not identifiable because there are many combinations of those seven parameters that will give us a very similar value of the density. And so it's very important to use an informative prior so that we can at least restrict some of the parameters. And what we do here is again, we did some, we, we had information for every replicate about the background noise. So we had not only the measurements, but also background data. And so we use that background data to get good estimates about the mean and standard deviation of the measurement error. And we, pretty, we use these estimates to have very strong informative priors so that we're basically left with roughly five parameters we'd estimate, which is, which is still a complex task. Um, and again, we, we use a similar strategy as before. We use a, a, an algorithm which is called a strategy, which is called Metropolis within Gibbs, which simply means that you do inference in blocks because you have many parameters and so you, you do them in blocks. Um, and again, each block we use that adaptive random walk strategy where we try to propose values following the correlation structure of the parameters. Um, and again, we did simulation studies. We make sure that we can recover roughly the parameters we simulated from. And finally, we did we, we fit the model to real data. So here we have, um, um, we have fish data, so fluorescence, in situ visualization data of a version of the HIV gene. We have two levels of simulation. So again, we have two conditions. Uh, four biological replicates, each replicate has 1,000 observations. So here is basically the data summarized. Uh, this is probably easier to follow. Four black and four red uh, dotted lines. Um, yeah, so the red dotted lines are higher stimulation and the black are lower level of stimulation. So we infer the model parameters and uh, maybe here I can kind of answer the question you asked before because here we, we focus a little bit about the interpretation of the parameters we infer. So these parameters that we have inferred are useful because they give us information. So you, we have actually here the hierarchical densities and not the hyperdensities because there's only four of them. So I can actually afford to plot eight lines in total. Well, before it was pretty much impossible to see anything. So a few things to note. If you compare the red and the black lines, you see that they're quite similar here. And these are the transcription rates and that they differ a lot here. And these are the rates to turn the gene on and off. And in particular, the gene turns on much more frequently, twice as frequently in the, um, in the, sti in the higher stimulated condition compared to the lower stimulated condition. Meaning that basically the stimulation does not affect significantly 
the um, this, the transcription parameter, but it rather affects significantly the frequency with which the gene turns on and off. And secondly, we looked at, uh, we did some reparameterizations. Basically, we take the original parameters and we model, we play with them to get to get to estimate quantities which are interesting for us. So this one here is the ratio between the transcription in the off and in the on states. And you see that it's quite low. It's below between zero and 4%, meaning that the transcription in the off state is significantly smaller than it is in the on state. And then here on the right, you see how often the gene is active. And you can see that it's mostly inactive. It's only active between three and 14% of the time. So five, 10%. So most of the time the gene is off. So again, this is consistent with what we knew so that the gene uh, has turns on rarely and has in turns burst because it's mostly inactive, then it rarely turns on and it transcribes a lot. But the other piece of information that we can extract here is that although transcription in the off state is low compared to the on state, the gene is mostly inactive. So overall, the off state contributes a significant amount of transcription. And you see here, it varies quite a lot, but it's about 10, 20% on average. So on average, 10, 20% of the transcription actually comes from the off state. So in conclusion, adding that extra arrow in the model was actually uh, helpful and it improved the model realism because it allows to account for this 10, 20% of transcription, which would have been otherwise associated to the on state. Uh, lastly, yeah, 625, um, we can also infer the average population of the original molecules of uh, mRNA, which in this case is varies between a few do a few tens to a few hundreds of molecules. Now, this is quite a big interval. And the reason why we have such a big interval is because this is actually a time evolving process and we only measure it at a single time point. So we can do our inference, but remember, the results always have the uncertainty in the original data. So in this case, there's not a lot of information in the original data. And, and that is reflected in the width of the uh, of the interval. Uh, and very lastly, you see here the ratio between the variance and the mean. So if you remember, I said before, in the Poisson, mean and variance are the same. Uh, so this ratio should be one. Here we estimate this ratio to be again between tens and hundreds of times. And so there is a huge degree of over dispersion, and that greatly justifies using an over dispersed model like the the two states on off model. Uh, conclusions, I'll skip this part because it's almost 6.30. Um, uh, and I mean, if you're interested, uh, we, we have the paper here. And importantly, I will conclude with a, with a picture that I really like about the David. And uh, if you haven't been to Florence, it, it's a really good place where to, to spend a few days. So happy to take a few questions about this second part.